a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, Ryan Musgrave Evans. He wrote an incredible book called Children of Orion, Finding the Crypto Terrestrials. This guy is fascinating. We have a wonderful conversation. He is an experiencer dialed up to 11. I uh, got the chills several, several times in this episode. I've never had a guest creep me out and do it multiple times an episode than I have in this one. So uh, without any further ado, guys, let's get to this conversation because it's outstanding. Ryan Musgrave Evans. All right, ladies and gentlemen, extremely excited to welcome this gentleman on. Uh, it is Ryan Musgrave Evans. So you've written an incredible book. Uh, it is called Children of Orion Finding the Crypto Terrestrials. Now what I like about this man, Straight out the gate, your chutzpah, your balls, the balls on this Australian over here telling us <laughs> that we're not out searching for crypto terrestrials. We're not going to poke around in the woods and see what we can see. No, we're going to find the sons of bitches. I love this angle. Before we get into your book, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Um, well, I'm Australian, um, 42 years old. Um, I've... Been a few different things over my life. I've been a primary school teacher for years. Uh, not a, Never a full-time one, but substitute primary school teacher or elementary school teacher, you'd say. Uh, worked on uh, tree farms, nurseries and things like that. They're basically the, the, the two biggest jobs I've ever had in my life. And uh, I really preferred the nursery work. Yeah, outdoors, <laughs> man. I get it. Yeah, yeah. The, the primary school, elementary school stuff bit too much multitasking for me. I'm a monotasker. I just get a little bit too freaked out. But outdoors, I suppose they're both sort of nursery work in a way, aren't they? But oh, yeah. A good call. Nursery people, nursery plants. But uh, yeah, I really loved that. Out, Just a farmhand, basically, I was. And I, I really loved that. But yeah, from Victoria, Australia. So um, the extreme northeast of the mainland, of uh, southeast, sorry, of the mainland of Australia. And uh, yeah, I've basically just lived in Victoria all my life. So I haven't done a huge amount of travel, but um, here I am, back, moved back to where I grew up, um, the Mornington Peninsula, and I've been back here about 10 years or so. But, uh, yeah. Well, uh, have you ever been on a walkabout? Because there's a ton of your country that nobody uses, right? Or they claim that it's inhospitable? Uh, this is true, yeah. Um, I haven't done a huge amount of travel myself, Uh some other members of my family, like one of my brothers, he um, is a real bushman and he really goes out there and does a lot of landscape painting out in the wilderness and things like that. I haven't been as adventurous as that. Um, I haven't even been to all of the states in Australia yet. I've been to half of them or so. But um, and most of it was when I was a kid as well. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's massive, massive chunks of, of Oz that are um, – they got no dudes there. Yeah. Well, there are dudes that there are dudes there probably, but not Homo sapiens. Uh, but uh, also, Indigenous Australians aren't necessarily in certain places that are as well. Um, there's places in Australia that really people have not gone um, and not gone for a long time. Some of it also due to what we're about to talk about, um, probably some of the eerie presences and prior inhabitants you know underground dudes um that has kept indigenous australians away in the past and also uh post white settlement has been the same really yeah Colin. continuation of that yeah i well beautiful segue that was my next question so we are going to get into your book but what got you interested in extraterrestrials crypto terrestrials the whole phenomena in general do you have a moment in time when you were like yep and i'm looking into that now uh yeah well i 
I'd had a lot of interesting experiences in my childhood that I hadn't really interpreted as being necessarily anything to do with extraterrestrials or crypto terrestrials and things like that. Um, weird experiences of waking up in the middle of the night and uh, not being able to wake the rest of my family and going out into the garden and there being tall, glowing, what I thought at the time were harlequins leaping in the air and being taken sometimes by them and things like that. And then um, in my teens, some interesting, weird stuff with shadow people and seeing invis- like beings with the kind of predator-like look to them when they're cloaking, like in the movie, the famous Schwarzenegger movie, Predator, that kind of cloaking, heat, shimmering look, th- seeing things like that or seeing people, big, pe- dark people up on hills out of the corner of my eye and then look and they're gone and things like that. So I had these little bits and pieces of what I have come to understand was, was interaction with crypto terrestrials. But um, it wasn't until uh, there were a couple when I moved, when I lived in the hills at one stage in the um, Dandenongs that are east of Melbourne, um, where there's a lot of gum forests, national parks and things like that. Um, at one stage, I that was when I was the nurseryman and um, had some interesting experiences waking up in the middle of the night with blo- fair people with huge blue eyes that would like run out the wall and once I'd seen them and things like that. It's pretty interesting. But it didn't really start kicking in until I moved back to the Mornington Peninsula, back to where I was born and raised. And then I had started having really significant events happening. Um, it started off a little bit like poltergeist-like events. Um, um, one particular event occasion I had, and you might think this is a very strange thought process to have in the first place, but I trimmed my nails one day. And I decided I'd go out in the garden and throw them into the yard. And I thought to myself, anyone who needs my DNA, help yourselves to that, dudes, right? Which is a very, very odd thing to think. It wasn't too long after that. I was outside in the garden suddenly and I was walking towards our front door and I had the keys and I opened it. I put it on the, the key on the peg levitated, went over the top of these like baby gates that our, our son was like two or three at the time, keeping him out of the kitchen and stuff, levitated over the top of them and went into bed and then was like, that was very, very strange. So I suspected something had happened then, but I'd only remembered the tail end of some kind of event. Hang on. So you, you, this happened to you physically? This wasn't a dream? This is something you physically, physically. remember? Yeah, yeah, fit or physically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some people, you know, skeptical people might say, oh, that was a dream or whatever, but uh, it was different to a dream. I'm fi- I'm, I've always been into lucid dreaming, and I'm fairly accomplished at lucid dreaming. My older brother taught me how to do it when I was in my teens. But you would He's know the difference, older. and this is I would, not Yeah, that. That, it, felt, it felt real to me. Right. Um, and but, and yeah, I want to yeah. just, no, 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 you're fine. I just want to say this straight. Uh, we do not judge here, man. Your story is your story. I'm really excited to hear this. Like, I'm taking this for everything that it is. So, you are one, you're in good hands here. You're at a, in a good place. <laughs> no you're, worries. It's a safe place. Well, get, so, enjoy. Well, man. it gets, for it. it gets freakier than this. So, Hell yeah. strap in, right? <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, so, I suspected that I'd been taken by something, right? And, um, I'd had experiences in the past years ago, actually, in the Dandenong Ranges camping in Belgrave Forest, a big e- eucalypt forest that's filled with mountain ash eucalypts that are like really massive trees, the biggest flowering plants in the world. Huge things, not as big as redwoods, but on the way to being as big as something like redwoods. 400, 500 feet tall and stuff. Camping out in this, this forest and it had, was trying to contact fairies because at one stage I was very much into Wicca, New Age paganism. I decided, and I'd seen when I was a kid, oh, man, I, I skipped one major event there. I'll go back to that. Hold on. I said, when I was about four years old, almost going to turn five, I had this event where I saw something behind a pine tree. But, uh, but because I'd seen something when I was a kid behind a pine tree, I, during waking hours, during the day, a sunny day in summer, um, I had this understanding that fairies and elves were probably real because I'd seen one myself and I still remembered it. So when I so that inspired a real interest in um, in paganism and druidry and Wicca, um, and I really got into studying Celtic linguistics as well, learning Gaelic. Um, and I, when I was about nineteen, I reached like an effective fluency in Scots Gaelic, um, and then a few years later, 
was became fairly good in Irish Gaelic as well, but it's Scots Gaelic's the the better one. Been learning it, speaking it to my kids and my wife now um, ever since. Um, but I had this I had this association in my mind between the the ancient Celts maybe and Gaelic language and the and Nishishan or Nahuishlan, the fairies and uh, the gentry and things like that. Um, now I so I, one stage there when I was about twenty I went camping into the hills and said I wanted to contact the fairies and I was camping there and that's when I had lights all coming down. I was on my own, lights all coming down through the trees, hands on the outside of the tent, um, just lying there sort of like complacent and passive, not being freaked out at all, which now I would think of as being a kind of uh, manipulation, calming my mind. Um, but um, and then I woke up and it was morning and had like missing time. I didn't remember falling asleep or anything like that. Um, so that was uh, then. So anyway, so I had this sort of kind of I would always had this idea that the, that that fairies and elves or some kind of subterranean beings that were either magical or technologically advanced. I didn't quite know sure those kinds of things come together in the end. I suppose sometimes you could see it as that, but um. Uh, so, but when I threw my fingernails out into the scrub and was having that thought, and then I had this first experience where I was levitating and stuff, I was thinking, this is bizarre, but I don't really know what's going on here, but something's going on. So I said in my mind, I think it was like a couple of nights later, if something took me, I'm happy about this and I want to experience this again. And then I was back outside again that night, standing on our veranda, and I thought it was a little bit odd, but I still had that kind of complacent thing where it wasn't that strange for some reason. I thought I started in a sort of like an obsessive compulsive kind of way, lining up coins and glasses that were on a table. And then I thought, okay, I'm now going to go inside. And as I went to do that, I started levitating. And I went, I'm not sure if I went up around the roof of the veranda or straight through it and then all of a sudden boom i was in a bed and i had one of my legs my right leg was crossed so the foot was like touching the knee and the other leg was out straight so there was a space on the bed right there where a woman was sitting thin woman with huge blue eyes looking straight at me and i just felt this serenity flow through me or wash through me and i'm like this is pretty sweet Damn. and then this huge dude walks over Fit huge finger, long fingers with gloves, starts feeling around inside my mouth like a dentist, checking out my teeth. And then he moved around the back and I felt them pushing on my head and just one of the most painful things I've ever experienced in my life, Push, stop doing some kind of procedure to the base of my skull, between like where the vertebrate goes into your skull, just intense agony. But also, but always with this sort of, serene feeling like i wasn't that concerned about it even though all this was happening then there was a like a scan and then images flashing across um my mind like images of forests and deserts and just the natural wildernesses and natural places and then i remember the the final image is the one i remember the best was some kind of weird building behind all these trees with a really big tree in front of it um and then I went to the bathroom and I could sense that there was still something in the house. I could feel it. Um, and then I went back to bed. So that, that w- and the next morning, our, right where I'd gone up over the roof, our, vid- our, our TV aerial was all twisted around, um, which, is, which was an interesting and the antenna. Yeah, the TV antenna on the roof. That was exactly where I'd gone up. Over around through. So did you go? Did you phase through the walls and ceiling and everything, or did you go outside and then ascend? I think I have done that too before, and I've even been returned upside down where I came down into our kitchen once. That was that was that actually happened only about half a year ago. That was something else. But the thing, the thing that that was a weird thing coming straight down, and they were in the kitchen, two of them still looking up at me, and I'm upside down, and I felt like I felt like the 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 dad out of Back to the Future where he's yes, there's something wrong yes. with his back and he's yeah. <laughs> 
it uh, sounds like they cocked it. It's like they didn't. They don't do that on purpose, so they're fallible. It sounds like there's there can be screw ups that occur. You know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was a screw up, or I don't know. So maybe was it your physical body that was upside down, or because yeah, my body. Oh, it's my body. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, have they yeah. always taken your physical body? I've I've heard the idea that your physical body sometimes stays there, and these beings will actually take your etheric body, and which still can have effects on your physical body. But basically, that's another explanation for somebody being able to phase through a door, or window, or whatever. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that. I just I've always it's presumed always been they you. just. I yeah. thought I, I I and I don't know why when we talk about phasing and everything like that in my mind's eye what I saw was you coming back down into the kitchen where your physical body is standing there and your astral body was upside down so now your head is where your feet are and they kind of screwed it up in that way but now I understand it was actually your physical body that's still cool yeah so yeah, did they, they drop they, you on your head did they spin you right before they let you right no then they they spun me right and put me back in bed as and um, but they have. And in their suits, when they're wearing their, your your listeners are going to be able to see the video for this, yes, are they? Or, yes, so, yeah, yes. yeah. So if I hold that up, these suits that they wear, which I call boa suits, named after the Antonio Villas boas case from Brazil. Yeah, and with Google um, eyes, as you say, yeah, goggled eyes, yeah. They um, yeah, they they have uh, glowing red eyes, which is some kind of enhancement to their night vision. I I think uh, they wear the helmet that has telepath tech in it. They're not naturally more tel- any more telepathic than we are as Homo sapiens, but they use technologies to augment. There are other beings, like ones that are called the Sabethana, I think they're called, that are organically, biologically, they have the capacity to influence your mind and have that kind of thing, and and it's through genetic engineering or something like that. But these dudes are more like us, the Majina or Tall Whites or Orions or whatever you want to call them. Um, or Shihan, the, the old Gaelic fairies, the whistling, chirping, subterranean dwelling fairies of old Gaelic law. Um, they um, can also become intangible with while they're wearing these suits. So they can walk through solid objects like they're shifting their particles. I, I wouldn't have a clue how that really works. It's all a technology. It's a technology, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, uh, these kinds of things seem to come together in the end. If a technology gets so advanced, so uh, um, inclined to think it all bleeds over into like a spirituality um but uh yeah so 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 that event um so that was that was the that one that i said where i went through the porch and then i was there on the bed and all this stuff was happening and the pain in the back of the head that was the turning point so that's it so i'll get i'll get back to your original question it was then really that then that was really where i got pulled into it wow um and then i was like yeah, <laughs> that I was like, okay, this is this is real. Something's going on here. And then I um, looked into online, just generally looked into stuff. Um, and I was really impressed with, you know, Stephen Greer's old disclosure project that I discovered. And I was watching that, and I was like, holy moly, this stuff's real. And then I was thinking, hold on a sec, the stuff that I'd seen and experienced when I was younger, these are the same people. And, uh, and this, the thing that I saw when I was a kid, so I'll quickly go back to that as well, is I would have turned five the next month or something, so I was four. My family had this tradition where we'd wander down illegally and <laughs> go down to the local golf course where there was a small pine wood, like you know, North American pine trees you'll be familiar with, but in a lot of golf courses around in Victoria and stuff, they grow a lot of pine trees and stuff. But, and we used to whip a bough off those trees for Christmas. Um, and we'd t- just take a, a, a limb. And we had this general idea. We'd never cut down a little tree. But we'd always just take a limb off a larger tree, so take, like drag it home. The Druid style where you just hang it up? Sorry? More of like the Druid style where they would just hang a branch? No, no, no. A big, big, big branch and then treat it as a tree. Oh, okay. yeah. And then Very treat cool. like because a big enough one and then treat it as a tree, you know. But, um, uh, so, so it was like about a week before Christmas in 1984, it would have been, um, I think 1984, 1983. Anyway, uh, I won't switch to a mathematical mind state at the moment because that'll just <laughs> throw me off my story here. But uh, even with simple maths like that, I'm like, uh, at the moment. Uh, no, the, I was there with my mum and 
my little brother was on her hip and I've got older siblings that are quite a bit older than me, like 10 years, 11, 12 years older and things like that. They jumped a little fence and they were in this little wood. And my mum and my little brother and I were still outside the fence. Uh, we were looking in and this this thing with like a try I, I thought this is as a kid i was like its head was shaped like a triangle and then it had like some kind of uh interesting sort of like ridges or something across the top of its head with huge black eyes really long fingers putting them around the side of the tree like that was peeking at me from behind the tree and going back in and coming out the other side and i said to mum like this was only like it's 20 feet tw- it's like 20 feet away. Oh. And I said to my mum, what is that? <laughs> and she goes, what? And I said, what is it? And she's like, I can't see what you're talking about. My brothers and sisters came from behind, dragging the pine tree, the, the limb that they'd cut down, walked straight past it. And they were coming from the side of the tree that it was on and just kept walking towards us. And it was, and I always thought of it as being the same texture of the bark of the pine tree. Like it was made out of the pine tree. Like the green man. Like the green man. Yeah, yeah. And, and nowadays I did. T- and well, it was one of these dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a suit. Like a, and it was pro- like now I understand that it was cloaking in some way. Or maybe part of the technology of the suit is that it can mimic actual textures around it. And mimic well, not only yeah, visually, well, but, you know, kind of like a cuttlefish or an octopus or something. They can mimic textures. It looks fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a thing as well. That's something I ha- That's something I might mention in the next book. Thank you very much. Yeah, because I didn't. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, cause, um, because I sort of think of their suits as being able to cloak and, and uh, throw images of what's behind forward so that they, you can't see them and things like that. But the idea of it actually developing the texture of something that's next to this happened. In that's, the movie. that's an interesting idea. Yeah, you know. And now that we're talking about it, this happened in the movie Science. Do you remember that movie by M Night Shyamalan? Alan? Whatever his name oh, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Shama, Shama, Lola, Lola. Shama, Lola, yeah. Lola. Uh, Whenever he <laughs> yeah. grabbed the uh, little boy, uh, his arm physically turned the pattern of the shirt. It was like a pattern. So oh. it wasn't even like a solid, like a like a, a chameleon or something was turn a solid color based on that. But this mimicked the pattern touch for touch, stitch, stitch for stitch. Then he also did it whenever he reached out under the pantry. I do a movie review show with a buddy of mine named Darcy Weir, and we covered this actually uh, with a guy named Gary King, who's really into crop circles. And you talk about crop circles in your book. I will segue back to that, I promise. Uh, And so we covered this movie, and so that was one of the things that we noted was the fact that uh, the skin actually turned, but the suit, of course, would have that ability. Yeah, well, that's that sounds like that's a good explanation for what it was doing on that cool. day. It's awesome. I yeah, that. that is. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so such a high a- technology. I mean, even just to say that, even just to fathom it, right, from our mortal perspective, you know, down here in this third dimension, whatever the hell these things are, which I do also want to get in with you. Uh, but we can only fathom the idea that, yeah, it's it's mirroring the steps behind us because we see this in predictive programming all the time. So. I feel like predictive programming is a very real thing. I don't know how you feel about that, uh, that the powers that be do this in movies and TV programs and news stories. They'll kind of roll things out to get everybody a little bit mentally at least aware that the idea is possible, even on a science fiction kind of a level. And they do this with like Harry Potter with the damn cloak thing. Uh, the Avengers use this kind of technology, um, you know, and one would say that Harry Potter or magic is a technology as well, you know, um, just more of a spiritual one. But uh it, it's an interesting concept, man, but I, I like the idea. And of course, so I want to circle back to your encounter, if you don't mind, the one where you were phys- so you were physically abducted out of the house and taken aboard a ship, or was this in your uh, bed? Which, uh, which uh, no, that was, well, no, it was in, it was on a craft. Okay. I was, ta- I was taken, and uh, that, so this is what you're talking about, yeah, when I had the, so, um, yeah, I was whipped up and up into something. And, in, and, I, and I don't know, like at one stage there, I thought that I had like maybe bashed into the TV antenna, the aerial. But since then, when I've been looking at other cases that have this kind of effect, at some kind, it's the anti-gravitics and the craft, I think, that are like messing with things uh, and, and it, ripping, ripping around metallic things that are nearby sometimes. And it's, that's a mistake, presumably. They don't mean to do it, but it's just, you know, like a, res- a, a symptom of them visiting it. But, um, yeah, so I was taken on a, thing, uh, on a craft 
there have been other occasions where I, f- where it's like they hijack your optic nerves or something, where well they do lots of different weird things where the fairies used to use glamoury and um and and these they do the the CTs do this kind of thing where they can make themselves look like anyone you know even people that are no longer with us that you might have liked so then you, you know people will assume they're ghosts but they're pretending to be an old grandma that you used to like or whatever uh that's no longer with you or whatever but also um they uh have done this thing to me at least twice where i know that i'm not in my bedroom anymore but it still looks like my bedroom oh. and i even turn my head and I can feel my body turning, but the image is staying the same. Oh, my God. Oh, why does this creep me out so much? <laughs> oh. And, and that, that actually, one of those happened like it was just a few months ago. And in that event, I was actually turned over and my face was pushed against the bed. But, I, but it still looked like I was at home just looking in my room like I'm still lying on my back. How disorienting is that? Very. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? What the hell? Okay, so, okay. I mean, I was just so creeped out by that. Just right when you said it, the way you said it, the visuals that it gave me. Oh, man. Okay, okay. Um, so even if you think you're still in your room, you're not necessarily in your room anymore oh as well. That's God. It, the whole idea of it, man, because I, I think reality is very different than what we're being told. I think that there's a lot more nuance to it. I, I think that this is nothing. And I, I think that we'd have a really hard time wrapping our mind around it. The, you know, my spirit guides or the entities, whatever, that are watching us do this right now in some dimension where they're standing right here. Uh, they're laughing right now because how creeped out I was about the vision being the same. They're like, <laughs> oh, if this asshole can't handle that, just he cannot, you know, unravel all those secrets of the universe. <laughs> uh, he doesn't have the stomach for it. So I wanted to ask you about the entities real quick, and then let's talk about your book. So uh, with the entities that were there, I know you mentioned a woman that was sitting on the edge of the bed um, with large blue eyes, and then a larger male that walked in. Was the male wearing the suit, or was he not wearing a suit, and then just had the long fingers with a glove on it? He, he, was, wear- he was wearing white, where they're, they're medics. So that, that particular occasion, I don't rem- really remember his face and his eyes and things like that. But on other occasions uh, where their medics, I've seen their medics right up close doing stuff. And that is when they wear something on their eyes that's like presumably like a smart tech or something. They put black lenses in their eyes and they have a mouth covering and they have a like, like doctors, like medics. Uh, you have an illustration of this in your book. Yeah. Yeah. They cover them, themselves up. Um, and they wear like tight white clothes. Sometimes it's sort of like an apron look or a robe or something like a dress down near their legs. Um, and it's quite often the older ones that will be doing this kind of stuff. And they're really freaking tall and their hands are really, really long, four really long fingers. So it's four, not three, or is there like a thumb and then three? There's four, four and then a diminutive like a, a like a vestigial thumb further up their hand, like the a palms dog's of their hands. Claw? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, like that. But it's sort of like a weird looking thing that's got like a little bulbous end, like completely useless, I would imagine. Uh, a split down the middle of their palms and their fingers. They so they have the kind of um, like opposable action that we'd have like this. They have it with their fingers, so their fingers spread out. Uh, and can face one another, not completely side on, but sort of, you know, enough at angles like this. Yeah. And then they're just, they hold things and it's dexterous. And it's more supple, I think, than even us. So it's even better at manipulating objects. Um, and, and then, and they, their nails, I've also seen their nails are pretty much like ours, but sometimes a bit longer, but not actually claws. So you've seen their bare skin? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They're just like super pale white. Yeah, yeah, really, really pale white, and but sort of like, um, sort of like, not like, like I'm very pale, but not like, like, not like us when we're really pale. Almost like it's like they're a, like the white of a sheet of paper, or the white of like an artificial like, um, white. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like and, and without markings, but like as well. So it's really, no really white, or... and almost looks like it's white marble or something like that. Like. 
no freckles. Could you see any veins or any vascular system or anything like that? I mean, if they have nails, that's an interesting addition. And it also yeah, shows nails. An I don't really recall the idea of seeing veins. Uh, no hair. Uh, there ha- I haven't seen freckles, but there has been um, cases like uh, the Antonio Fanio Villas Boas case. He talks about her having freckles on her shoulders, I think, or there's freckles he saw on her body. Or maybe some uh, kind of marking, you know, like some sort of artificial marking, like a tattoo. Or maybe, something. or maybe even like cosmetics to appear more like us than they actually yeah, do we, sometimes. We wear it like this around here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But so, so they wear, and they wear their claw, they wear claws when they're wearing these other suits, though, which are like, uh, you know. So do they have ears and a nose that you could see? Because there's different descriptions about greys and what, how was head shape? Was it oversized? Was it pretty proportionate to the body? The, the shorter ones have short, squat, fairly broad faces. I don't think their faces necessarily become narrow as they get older, but their faces definitely get longer. So it looks like they become narrower as they get older and older over the centuries, their faces get longer and longer until the really old ones have really long drawn out faces with huge heavy pointed chins that hang way down they have hardly anything in the way of ears you can sort of see a bit of an ear some of them have more structure to their nose than others some of them like it's just the individual variation i think you know some of the individuals have really flat faces with hardly any of a rise with nostrils others have more structure to the bottom of their nose and then others still even have like the slightest bit of a bridge depending uh, and i think that maybe that has also something to do with their age I, i'm not 100 percent sure about that because thinking about it the shorter ones and that's a good way to tell their age they take a long long time to grow so if they're about five foot tall um they're they're, they're probably going to be about 50 or 60 years old or something like that because yeah, they live for hundreds of years right yeah they get to about six foot there's room for variability and individuality and all this, of course. But when they get to about six foot, they're about 100 and they stop growing and then they grow in windows, like windows of growth, like periods of growth over their lives. When they get to about 400 years old, they really start rocking. They really start getting really, really tall. And then seven to 800 years old, they can be, I've seen them like eight to nine foot tall. And some of their priestly class wears long cloaks, floor length cloaks with hoods. Uh, and particularly the elders are really freaking impressive, eight, nine foot tall. Charles Hall in his book, uh, the Millennial Hospitality books, he's a, a, a experiencer of the same beings that I am. He um, talks about uh, one of them being 10 foot tall that he saw. So, there's a, so that might be a little bit taller than I've ever seen, but massive disparity in heights depending on their ages. But even if they're like, if they're five foot six or something like that, um, they're going to be like 70 or 80 years old uh, and an adult by us or an elderly person by our standards. But for them, that's, they're just at the beginning of their life. Yeah, they're just getting cranking up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're just getting cranking. But, uh, so, you know, it must be hard for them to shop for clothes then. It's like the opposite of us here, you know, on this planet where our kids, you know, go through these growth spurts and they're like, ah, oh, I just bought those shoes. Now I'm going to go buy more. <laughs> it, at the end of their life or their sessions, when they grow in those spurts, you know, they jump like what, 10, 12 sizes uh, at, a, at a juncture there. I bet in their society, yeah. <laughs> they have the opposite sales. You know, they're like, hey, come in and get your... You're uh, gr- growing in leaps and bounds sale and we'll upgrade yeah. your clothing or something like that. I'm sure they don't have the stupid systems that we do. Um, so what do you think about the idea that maybe because whenever I hear about all of these different concepts and I'm fortunate enough to be able to speak to amazing people like you, man, your, your story is incredible. What you've experienced, the way you articulate it, you, you're a badass. I'm grateful. What I've, what I've <laughs> come you. to find most interesting about all of this is the variance in experiences that are out there, even with the same what we would call extraterrestrial UAP, uh, crypto terrestrial type of phenomena, where if you kind of put it in its own category of that, there's so many still. You're talking about different races, different things telling you that they're interdimensional and not from a star system. You've got things telling you they're from a star system. Oh, but not from that one. We're from that one over there. Um, and so you you have this variety of experiences. Do you it makes me think of, okay, did you ever like adopt a wild animal in school? Remember when they were like, hey, adopt a whale or adopt a tiger and your third grade class got together and you all put money and you sent it off and they sent you a picture of a whale in the wild and you're like, that's my whale. Did you ever do that? <laughs> no, I don't think we didn't have that. I do don't you guys think. don't that's like a- animals over there? 
Yeah, not really. Okay, no, no, yeah, no, no. Fuck not no whales anyway. Right? Yeah, fuck them. Uh, so yeah. uh, <laughs> the only reason I mention it is because it makes me think of maybe we're something like that on this planet. We're just some sort of adoption program for these different style of entities, and they're like, "Ooh, I want to adopt Orion," you know, this time. And they go and they adopt you, and they're fo- that one particular group of entities is focused on you. Have you gotten any other type of entity interaction? Uh, no. No, and, and, and I... This is what I'm thinking I, about this, is it might be like you're tagged or something like this, because you, you do find this. Whenever people talk about it, they specifically talk about the greys, because that's all they've had experience with. They specifically talk about reptilians, because they've... Same with Bigfoot, same with everything. I'm under the impression and under the idea lately, especially, um, again, after speaking with amazing people like you, that it's all connected. Um, Paul Askoff wrote a wonderful book. He's under your publishing company, Flying Disc Press. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, UFOs, The Real Story? Uh, yeah, I have heard. I haven't read that book yet. But yeah. I've, ha- I've had him on. Check out the episode. It's back in the catalog. But, dude, this is, this is it, right? It, it explains it. And it explains the fairies. It explains all of this stuff. That it's not necessarily other star systems. It could be, but it's more of an interdimensional phenomena. It kind of explains explains how they're able to phase in and out and all of that. Now, to your specific experience with the entities that you're talking about, I find it extremely interesting that it's all all of their woo woo and all of their powers are based in technology. That it's not a evolutionary advantage that they've obtained or adapted or something like that or just how they are uh it's it's a technological enhancement which lends to the idea uh have you ever heard of dr michael p masters no okay same thing back in the catalog you got some listening to do there ryan uh (laughs) and he is a biological anthropologist wrote a book called identified flying objects one of his his hypothesis is as an anthropologist that they're future humans coming back in time machines now, what, what's interesting about this and why I ask you about the entities is because of this guy and his work. The way that he talks about it is, is that bipedalism, or two legs, two arms, a torso, and a head, these are, this has only happened once on this planet, and it's been us. Whenever you talk about beings, then, that you are seeing, my mind tends to filter it through this lens simply because I find it fascinating. And the more you talked about it being a technological thing, not necessarily a spiritual or interdimensional type of woo-woo, electromagnetic type deal, that they needed the aid of technology to pr- produce this, it makes me think more to that idea. Have you ever heard of that hypothesis? Yeah, yeah, they are future humans. Yeah, they've told me that as well. These ones, this yeah. is so cool. They, well, they, well, that depends on what you mean as well, because they get... They've told me a lot of stuff. Okay, where get into that. It depends on time travel. Time travel is really interdimensional travel. And what these, they are from a, not our future. What they have done is they have impoverished genomes. They left Earth around 50,000 years ago for them, or more than that, actually, uh, and went to the moon for a period, then went to Mars, and then ended up in, uh, on an Earth-like planet orbiting Al- Al-Nalam, which is the middle star in Orion's belt. Um, but uh, they developed uh, through too much, uh, maybe from being away from the Earth for so long, you could see it like that, but, and also mutations, and, uh, but also um, genetic interference, like manipulation and uh, uh, genetic engineering and attempting to um, increase their lifespans and longevity. Are generally altering themselves, altering themselves in a lot of way, and destroying something, unraveling their own DNA, which they and they developed maladies, pathologies. They've had to access, um, not like really like they haven't gone back in time. Which I don't know if that's actually possible to move in your own timeline. I don't think it necessarily is. What they've done is instead of going up and down in their own timeline, they go located. A, a parallel timeline that it, for all intents and purposes is identical to the way their one was 50,000 years earlier and jump across to that. So we are not their ancient selves. We are like an, a version of their ancient selves that is identical. In a different timeline. And now they're, and they've been, but they did that into the past. They've been here for thousands of years, but they can't develop a proper way of permanently fixing themselves. So they constantly require into breeding with us yes. to augment their own, uh, you know, uh, impoverished DNA. So, y- yeah, future lineage humans. And, in fact, well, the, 
there's, from what I understand, there's four of them, and there's a, but there were four. There's only two left. There's them, and then there's another one, which are the Sepetan are, are like the beings from the Virginia incident. If people were interested in like an actual case in Brazil, the I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but they they look a bit like greys, but they're brown, oily, scaly skin, ridges on their heads, long dark claws. Like reptilians. Uh, another, uh, like reptilians, yeah, but they're future lineage humans, not um, uh, and relate well interdimensional. So just, sort of like future lineage humans. It's in, just in politicians, a, a sense, but. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's that's what they that's what they are. As far as I know, as a, I know, and the idea of there being uh, life forms that are extrasolar, extraterrestrial truly, or even extrasolar from outside our solar system that have evolved independently from the Earth and independently from, from us, have nothing to do with us in that respect, but are, are sophisticated and can whip around and visit us if they I don't know anything about them uh, and I don't think that they are necessarily as involved with us as these other guys because it's sort of like a family thing. These particular entities the ones that I've met, which are the same beings as uh, the Chris Bledsoe case. Chris Bledsoe has his own ideas about his own experiences, and he's, I've talked to him a couple of times. He's the loveliest dude. He's a deeply spiritual man. He interprets his own experiences very much through a lens of his own uh, form of Christianity, etc. But I am, well, I know that they're the, they're the same beings as the ones I'm in contact with. The tall whites, the Charles Hall kind of beings, kind of future lineage human. But um, they're, the, they're the ones that have been influencing our world, influencing our um, or pol- politics sometimes, but uh, spiritual worldviews, uh, folklore, um, everything about our society really is sort of modelled on interpretations of the occasional empirical direct evidence that these guys are there and now and then we build upon that and cult, have our own cultural lens as to what they are and and give them like paint intricate tapestries of who the beings may be and add them to our mythologies and all that kind of stuff and go off on tangents away from the actual nature of the beings sometimes but um but some some mythologies in the past have sort of retained a more or less or a better idea than than we have nowadays in the most part as to what they were, like the fairy faith of Celtic countries, they were fairly close in a lot of ways, I think, as to knowing what they were. They thought of them as being other people that were living underground. They had magical abilities, could become invisible. You had to keep them appeased sometimes. If you threatened them, you could, they could kill your animals or you even. Um, uh, and this kind of dance, living cheek by jowl with these guys that they took to be a real daily interaction informing their lives as well and i think that in particular the jinn a jinn of, of uh, middle eastern mythology and stuff sometimes when i read about the jinn it seems quite obvious to me that these are all these are a, a description of the gaelic fairies but by middle eastern um like pre uh, uh pre uh islamic beliefs oh it, it, people in islam still believe in the jinn and things like that but there's sort of like a bleed or leftover from from earlier pagan uh semitic people and persian people and things but um yeah so some of them have been closer to it than others and in some ways some of the old cultures and older civilizations were closer to understanding what the their true nature i think than mainstream society is today but um yeah, that, that, I, I, I'm not sure about ex, true extraterrestrials, true aliens that have no genetic relationship with us. Uh, I have no idea about anything like that. Um, and I, I sort of doubt that they'd be overly interested in us because they don't have, because there are, the, the, the world, like the, the universe is full of life and they have their own places. This is probably not overly interesting to them. But certainly those people that, um, that are future versions of ourselves or sort of interdimensional versions that have this genetic relationship or affiliation with us, they're very, very interested in us because we're a crutch to them now as well to, to keep them alive. And every new generation of theirs requires a little bit of an influence from us. Um, it's not parasitic necessarily. It is symbiotic because 
they also make sure the Earth's okay when it comes to like uh, solar activity, ensuring that the, the sun doesn't uh, knock out electrical grids and, and uh, tapping into that. And um, and they have future-looking technology and things like that as well. Uh, they can see potential futures and they pilot reality in the sense of like piloting a TV show or piloting a research project or something like that. They can see many turns ahead and decide what kind of actions to perform now, who to talk to, what to do. Activities that might seem absurd to people who can't see into the future like they can. But for them, each of their actions is a long game, you know. So you go, why are they why are they interested in talking to that person there, but they ignore that person? What's you know, what's so important about that person over there? But the point is is that there might not be any reason for it until a development a century later, a couple of centuries later, or they're laying seeds for developing they're hijacking timelines for their own gain. For ours as well now though, because it's kind of like a symbiotic thing. We are in a sense some people probably don't like me saying this, but because it's um, uh, it's a little bit derogatory when it comes to Homo sapiens or something, or, or maybe it sounds like it is a little bit parasitic or something like that on their part. But we're sort of like free-range ancient humans to them, where they um, they they take what they need from us. Sometimes they have these interactions. They wipe our memories. Sometimes they'll leave people with a, some kind of experiences and memories. But to me. Sorry, I'm sort of going a little bit off on a tangent right now, but I'll just qu- I'll just quickly say this that um, yeah, it's one thing like seeing say UFOs or UAPs or maybe having some kind of close encounter where you see a being you know wandering around picking flowers or something like that, and go okay, that's normally interpreted in mainstream society. You go, that's an ET experience, you know, that's that this person is having some kind of encounter here. But the real tick in the box for me when I – well, for, for um, uh, indicating, a, a real indicator for me that, that the particular beings that I am in contact with and know uh, are influencing someone else's life, if, if someone tells me that their house is haunted, if someone tells me that, um, you know, that their muesli, their bowl of muesli has disappeared from the kitchen counter and it's suddenly in the freezer or – they hear voices in their house at night, footsteps, dark shapes moving through walls, um, levitating, glowing people, luminous people, um, even to the extent of seeing people that uh, shouldn't be there that are in their house, perhaps even people that are deceased um, and interpreting them as ghosts and things like this. Um, when I hear about that kind of thing, I think they're probably a tall white experiencer. Um, and feeling hands on you in the middle of the night, not, ne- not necessarily like something that's going to be a red light for, e- would normally be interpreted as ET related, like let's say, like, like a situation I talked about before where there's tall entities doing things to you and they're in masks and they're obviously like cutting you open and doing things to you. Like in our mainstream society and also in mainstream ufology, I suppose you'd say, with ufology is fringe, but mainstream, the mainstream of the fringe, people would normally interpret that as being um, ET related. Yeah, that goes into the basket. But if you are lying in bed at night and suddenly you feel hands touching you Ugh. and maybe turning you over or a hand on your back or something like that, that goes in the ET basket too. That Ugh. doesn't like that. That's not. See, but, but normally people go, oh, my house is haunted. There's a ghost or something like that. But this is what they do. They, they wake up in the middle of the night and, like, feel a hand on my face and then wake up and sort of look and maybe not see anything but the hand. I can still feel the hand and I'm like, oh, they're here. Oh, my God, dude. And, yeah. and they're doing something and I've woken up and they may have, they're allowing me to, to feel it or whatever. Or like a sharp pain suddenly in my arm and I'll look, wake up and I'll look and there'll be this big dark thing standing right next to me. And I'll think, oh, they're doing, they're, they're like in, injecting me with something or taking a sample or something. And it, you'll just, you get this feeling like everything's cool, just don't worry about it. And I just fall back to sleep. Um, 
but a lot of a lot of things that are normally be categorized as sort of like uh, ghostly hauntings and things like that are them a lot of the time in my opinion uh and not necessarily related to the idea of like deceased humans hanging about still in places they used to live in and all that kind of stuff it's attributable to these guys. This is the part of it, though, because now it now it's start now I'm looking through it through this lens. Because yes, if they're able to manipulate their physical appearance, they can appear as anything. They can appear as Bigfoot. They can appear as large dog man. They can appear as your grandma. Uh, they can appear as all kinds of cool stuff. Mothman, perhaps. Uh, all of these things now again are be- looking more and more interconnected. But it may be via a technology, not necessarily something that is like a superpower, but I mean, any advanced technology would look like magic to us because we're just stupid, dumb cows running around on this planet. Uh, And there's something I wanted to ask you about that here in just a second. But to finish my point on this, it sounds like whenever um, you talk about that they just use us as a resource, that they have this technology, is it possible that what they're doing whenever they're able to see into the future, is it possible that what they're able to do or what they've done is created a technology or a computer that's so advanced that it can play out every possible scenario given a set of parameters? Like they can rule a bunch of things out. Okay, we're on this side of the universe. We want to see if we make this decision, what will happen, or if we make this decision, what will happen. And there's such a strong quantum type algorithmic computer that we can't even fathom that will manufacture or manifest this close as it comes type of a observation of that do you think that's possible oh yeah maybe yeah you mean they are lucky that their future looking technologies prophetic technologies are doing that yeah you're suggesting maybe yeah they're accessing they're accessing reading potentials and it's the process is so powerful it can really just pump through potential worlds to indicate to them how they should behave yeah are you suggesting rather rather than them literally looking into the future into another timeline somehow they're manifesting it this way yeah it's like uh, well, a that's simulation possible. Yeah. we uh, simulate asteroids if they're going to hit earth or something just way better like way better um and then maybe whenever, yeah yeah i mean it's just possible i just like you know jumping down the idea rabbit hole here um i i think it's awesome man your your book is fantastic by the way uh you sent me an advanced copy of it i do really really appreciate this uh it's awesome i love talking to you about this kind of stuff i you've creeped me out more than any guest um (laughs) which is really interesting i i will say that uh it's interesting because it's i i don't know what it is about the concept when you describe it because i've heard this described quite a bit not in the same way of course there's variations to this what what interests me about all of this, of course, is how fantastical it is, but how personal it is. Also, you are way more cool with being poked and prodded and woken up with creatures standing around you than I ever will be. Uh, even though you know it's whatever you know about it or however you feel about it, I would not be cool with it. That's probably why it's happening to you and not to me. That makes sense to me. Well, um, yeah, well, my... my- I'll tell you, I don't think he'll mind me saying this. Um, my father, um, he, uh, when he was about my age, so in his 40s or so, he started dabbling in um, out-of-body experience type stuff and he read Robert Munro and uh, he was practising like different p- protocols and things like that and he projected his mind onto a beach somewhere he decided he was going to a lot he was lying in bed and he just sort of decided he was going to project his mind onto a beach somewhere and an invisible while he was there on the bed and he was sort of imagining a beach i think he was saying he was going to be in queensland or something like that someone sat on the bed next to him that he couldn't see he leant over and giggled into his ear oh, God. and he freaked out Ugh. and he gave and he gave it up he said uh, no that's it for me He's also seen UFOs and things when he was younger, and he also has a memory when he was a kid of a huge black shape with huge eyes staring in the window at him when he was a kid. So he, I am fairly certain, is an an, an experiencer as well, but because his reaction was so fearful, it's like they they might still be do they might still be there interacting with him but they don't let him remember it exactly that's this a, is the thing they want you to be okay with it even though they're doing something that's not okay they're because that's the other thing about this this is not okay they might hijack your mind into thinking that it's okay but this is a violation <laughs> of everything that is it is to be you right and and this is why yeah i've i've thought about this for a long time too that it's just kind of we're just an experiment or, or we're a resource for them and that's maybe why and 
again, predictive programming. You probably nailed it with this. Think of the Granada Treaty with Eisenhower. What was that the condition on? Of course, it's an alleged thing. We don't know if it really happened or not. But the alleged narrative of that was that Eisenhower met with these ETs at Area 51 S4, something like that. He just was flown out into the desert. He had some missing time stuff. They explained it away with something like a toothache or something like that, right? A dentist in the middle of the night. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 another one you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, and so he goes, allegedly makes this treaty, but in that treaty, he agreed to swap human beings, Americans, for technology. And so then the thing was, though, and the caveat, and here's where you know it's crazy, and probably you're spot on in what's going on with this, is because then they said, well, yes, you could take a certain amount of people, but you have to make a list of all of them. Aliens, we're just going to trust you with your technology. You need to make a list of all of them, and you can't take too many. That went out the window the second they turned around. I mean, now they just do whatever right, the hell yeah. they want. They never needed our consent anyway. I think that maybe what happens with that, and if there's any validity to it, the idea could be that he basically swap technology for that and in return there's a huge cover-up that happens with their presence with their actual motives if you told people that we are cows for aliens to do with whatever the hell they want and all of the shit around here is just a distraction to keep you from figuring that out uh, what would happen you know to all the it, there'd be riot there'd be chaos everything would just shut the fuck down and that's why they give you the bread and circus maybe is to distract you from the fact that we're just cattle yeah, may maybe. Well, we, we are in a sense. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, but it is sort of a mutual benefit. Um, and then uh, I don't know about those particular ones, like the ones that people talk about and call greys that are another kind of like future lineage human that are similar to the Sabetna, but um, from a little bit earlier in their history, I think they were closely related to them. Uh, they are less altruistic than the ones that I know, or maybe they're telling me to think that. <laughs> See, this is another question I've got, uh, yeah. is you're always working from their perspective or from their truth. Yeah. You're always learning something from their perspective. This is this is That's why, right. again, it's interesting to me that only one type of entity or one type of creature generally uh, contact people. And it sounds like your dad had the same thing. Yes, it runs in your family, which is a question I had written down for you. Does this shit happen to your, to your ancestors, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, it, it is this weird thing to where it's only one of them. You got to take their word for it. What if it's all gin and they're just screwing with everybody? Yeah, well, that's right. Well, they can, well, these guys, like the, these guys that are the gin, or they call themselves mud ginner. And I'm not sure if the, if the Semitic word gin, gin is actually, related to that very word they've given me for themselves, Majina, which I think as well is the same word as Wanjina well, in the like Kimberley. Yeah. Well, that's right as well. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, but this is a word for themselves in their own language. Right. I'm not quite sure of the relationship it has to words in English that, that or, you know, Homo sapiens languages that might sound similar to Maj and things Maybe like that. Maybe English got Magi from their word. Maybe it's the other that, word. Well, Maybe that, we got it from them. It is a possibility, and I've also wondered whether maybe the Majestic and MJ12 and is like a nod to them. Yes. As well, because what is the etymology of Majestic? Why would I don't know. Have you ever read about that? Why the Majestic were called that? No, I don't. I, I, but I know very well about it, but that's not a question I asked. Why the name? No, good call. I thought yeah. it was just a dope name anyway. It was cool. Yeah, it is cool now. But yes, this may be this. They may be running everything. You know, they disguise themselves as different things of otherworldly beings. They can hijack your consciousness. They can make you remember or not. They, you know, and and think about this, man. How screwed up would this be? Have you ever seen the movie uh, Dark? Uh, shit, forget the name of it. Anyway, it had a young Dark City. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yes. Did it have a young Kiefer Sutherland in it? And he had glasses. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. He's the professor. Wasn't he? Yeah. Think about this. What if you have, what if this isn't your family? What if like this isn't, you know, all of the things around you are implanted, implanted memories. What if they swap your wife out every other month? What if like <laughs> you, you know, and, and then they make you just think that this is the life that you live. Yeah, well, I mean, now you're starting to freak me out, man. Well, um, I've done no, a lot of well, mushrooms, no. so just it's okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's that's you know, cool. When you yeah, get on those rabbit holes. Of course, it's just speculation, but it's crazy, man. What if they can hijack your consciousness to erase people? Like they're like, oh, we need uh, your brother to go off world and battle some other aliens for us. So we're just gonna forget that you knew that you ever even had a brother, and then we're gonna shag ass and take off, and you just continue living your life. Well, that's true. Once you you 
you you pick the the scab on that saw, you can it, it goes deep, doesn't it? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. If if they if you if they're manipulating your mind, where does it end? That is exactly. that is true. Yeah. Um. And so, I mean, the, yeah. The, I mean, of so course, is any of this real? There's a question. Well, that's well, yeah. I mean, that's right. The the old the sort of like skeptical philosophy. Yeah. S- skeptical philosopher of that real pushing the bounds on reality. But um, someone has asked me before, which is true, and I, even though I'd say I'm 99% certain that it's not the case, it is a possibility that the beings, the way they have presented themselves to me, the Mudjina, as they present themselves to me sometimes and I see them as they truly are, as Charles Hall saw them as well in his Millennial Hospitality books, what if they don't even look like that either? Yes. Right. Yes. But that, that is a possibility, of course. Just light of beings. Course. Yeah. And it's, maybe it's nano. I doubt it. Uh, I doubt it, but then I would doubt it, wouldn't I? <laughs> uh, exactly. <'Cause> <laughs> exactly. This is the thing. And maybe it's all the same damn thing. They're just telling everybody and appearing to everybody differently. And they're just telling everybody, hey, we're from the star system because we've looked into your mind and that's what you most want to believe. So that's what you're most comfortable with. We're not going to tell you the truth of where we are. We don't have time to unpack all that. Just go with this. We're from this place. And future humans and time machines, again, the argument on that would be if they didn't want you to know that you could create time travel, they would tell you that they're from somewhere you can't go just far away, right? With some technology you don't have. So uh, I love this idea, dude. This is fascinating. And it could be all the same damn thing. They just show up in different forms. We're just a big loose or energy or resource to these things. It's a prison planet. Ryan Musgrave, thank you so much, man. Yeah, cool, dude. Yeah. So yeah, uh, a- tell me about uh, how we can find your book and then we will wrap here. But I'm definitely going to have you back on, dude. You're just an incredible guy, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to come back. It's really fun. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, the book. The book's on Amazon currently um, as paperback and hardback and uh, um, as a Kindle. And it's in the pipeline for it to be an audio book at some stage. The the guy, there's been a guy selected to, to do that. Are you and he's working it? on that. I'm not reading it myself, uh, no. You have such a great voice and a great accent. You should read it. <laughs> Well, the dude, the dude reading it actually happens to be an Australian as well, so that's that's appropriate, I suppose. But I'm skeptical. But, but um, if you if you give him a pass, <laughs> we'll go with it. But I think you would do a great job at it. You've got a wonderful voice. No, oh, oh, cheers, cheers. But uh, um, yeah, the, so so it's on Amazon. Okay, uh, cool. I'll link all that in the show notes. This press and- yeah. Yeah, and Philip Mantle is a good friend of the show. Uh, we've interviewed quite a bit of his your team over there. So you're just part of the Soul Tribe, brother. Cannot thank you enough, man. You are a fascinating dude. Thanks a lot for creeping me out. My wife's going to love this episode because she loves stuff like that. If she really even is my wife, if they haven't swapped her out by the <laughs> by, while I've been sitting in here. So, uh, uh, damn, Ryan Musgrave Evans, man, you are a badass, dude. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking with you in the future, man. Don't be a stranger. Okay, cheers, man. Thanks so much, Brandon. Good stuff. Great to be here. Great to be here. Great to be here. Freaking amazing, freaking creepy, right? Uh, all the ways, of course, to find Ryan will be located down in the show notes. His book is outstanding. You guys make sure you check out a copy. Uh, there's a lot more in there, guys. We we scratched the surface on it and just kind of went off on these amazing ideas. The dude is fascinating, guys. Go go check him out. Show him some love and support. He's Soul Tribe for sure. We will have him back on. So uh, as far as the music that you're hearing underneath this, guys, this is a good friend of mine named Vinny. He's Vinny the Saint. He's located down in the show notes. Go check his music out. He's got some new stuff that he's dropping, and it sounds incredible. So thank you, Vinny. Your music's awesome. Keep moving forward, brother. As for this show, guys, you can find us at expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where the links to all of the socials will be found, as well as the YouTube video of this. If you're an audio-only audience, that's awesome. Thank you for listening. But there's a whole video component to this over on YouTube, 100% free. Go check it out. Uh, Also, go out into your week this week, guys. Just pick up a piece of litter. Be nice to everyone and every animal that you come across. Uh, Get out of the left-hand lane, of course. If you're feeling up to it, it's a wonderful thing to just buy the person in line behind you a coffee or a meal or something like that. It really changes the day for everyone involved, especially you. So uh, check that out. Uh, As well as uh, if nothing else, you take nothing else from this uh, program here with all these incredible guests that I'm grateful enough to get to speak to. Uh, Go out into your world this week, guys, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.